Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn about international relations. Today's topic is the rationality of terrorists, which leads us to an obvious big question. Are terrorists rational? The answer to this question is yes, but to get to why that's the case, I want to first ask you a question, which is, which of these two people is rational? Is it person one who says, I prefer the Los Angeles Angels to the Milwaukee Brewers, I prefer the Milwaukee Brewers to the Chicago Cubs, and I prefer the Chicago Cubs to the Los Angeles Angels? Or is it person two who says, I prefer blowing myself up to kill five people to working a nine to five desk job. I prefer working a nine to five desk job to listening to IR 101 lectures. And I prefer blowing myself up to kill five people to listening to IR 101 lectures. So think about this for a moment, pause the video if you need to, and in the comment section, go ahead and answer person one or person two as the rational individual. And if you'd like to explain why the person that you selected is rational and why the person that you did not select is not rational. So go ahead and do that now. And we will reveal the answer in a moment, but I first want to define rationality. So rationality has a very simple definition. An actor is rational if his preferences are complete and transitive. That's it. Now, we'll define completeness and transitivity in a moment here, but what I want to emphasize on this slide is that when we say an actor is rational in this modeling world, in an economic sort of modeling sense, we do not mean rational in the same way we do in common language. In everyday language, when you say rational, you probably mean it as a synonym for sensible, and that's not the case here. Rationality does not equal sensibility. In fact, we can find individuals, and we'll see an individual in a moment, who is rational but not very sensible by any stretch of the imagination. So let's now get to completeness and transitivity. Completeness is an axiom about preferences. And what it says is that given any pair of alternatives, A and B, you can think of alternatives A and B as outcomes, just any two outcomes in the world that an actor might care about. Take any two outcomes, and for an actor's preferences to fulfill this completeness axiom, then the actor must prefer A to B, or he must prefer B to A, or he must be indifferent between A and B. So that's fairly innocuous. What that is essentially ruling out is if I asked you what you feel about A versus B, you can't just throw your hands up in the air and not tell me anything. It's fine if you want to be indifferent between A and B, but you can't just not state anything. You have to say something, whether it's a preference for one or the other or indifference. You got to tell me which one. So that's innocuous, I think. The second assumption the second axiom about preferences is transitivity. And this says, given three alternatives, again, three different possible outcomes, A, B, and C, if an actor prefers A to B and he prefers B to C, then transitivity requires that he must prefer A to C. What this is trying to rule out is a preference cycle. So to illustrate what a preference cycle looks like, that would be this. So this guy prefers A to B, that's why we're drawing that arrow from A to B. He prefers A to B. This actor prefers B to C, and he prefers C to A. But this creates some ridiculous situations, and that goes back to the original question. Let's look at what person one's preferences actually say. So we can replace A, B, and C with Angels, Brewers, Cubs. See why I did those three teams, right? A, B, and C. What this guy's preferences say is that he prefers the Angels to the Brewers, he prefers the Brewers to the Cubs, and he prefers the Cubs to the Angels. This is a huge problem because if you ask this guy what his favorite team is among these three teams, he can't really tell you an answer. If he says that the Angels are his favorite team, you can then counter and be like, hey, you know, you said that the Cubs are preferred to the Angels. You like the Cubs more than you like the Angels. How can the Angels be your favorite team? So the Angels can't be his favorite team, but the Brewers are also can't be his favorite team because he said he prefers the Angels to the Brewers. And then lastly, the Cubs can't be his favorite team because he said he prefers the Cubs to the Brewers. So this is problematic because this guy just does not have a favorite team. He's very confused about the world. Now, in contrast, person two, he's confused about the world in a different way. Whereas the baseball guy was irrational, person two actually has rational preferences here. So if you asked him what his favorite outcome is among bombing himself up into millions of pieces, working a nine to five desk job and watching what he thinks apparently are really terrible international relations videos, this guy would tell you that his most preferred outcome is suicide bombing, right? He prefers suicide bombing to everything else. 
He doesn't have these strange preference cycles where he doesn't have a particular favorite outcome, unlike the baseball guy does. So what that means is that person one has not sensible preferences and also not rational preferences. So he's not rational because it doesn't fulfill transitivity, and he's not very sensible because if your preferences don't fulfill transitivity, you're going to be saying some really confusing things. So he doesn't fulfill rationality or sensibility. Meanwhile, the guy on the right here, person two, he's rational because he has complete and transitive preferences. Of course, he's not very sensible on the other hand, because he prefers killing people, right? Which you and I would think of him as a bit of a psychopath, but that's fine. He's still rational. He's just not very sensible. Now, taking this into a deeper level, we're trying to study terrorism, right? We want to understand how terrorists behave, why terrorists behave the way they do. Well, some people might tell you that you can't do this. So a common criticism of this sort of modeling is that terrorists are irrational and crazy, and therefore we cannot model their behavior. And this, to be honest, is probably the worst argument you will ever hear. I get really frustrated and really irritated whenever someone says this, because it probably means that they spent a year or two years or however many years learning about international relations or something to that effect from someone who didn't understand what was going on and taught the other person something wrong, which is that when you say rationality the way we do, again, it's just completeness and transitivity. It's not sensibility. And terrorists, they actually fulfill some sort of rationality. Terrorists have well-defined goals, right? We may think that their goals are stupid because they involve killing people and killing innocent civilians, stuff that we don't like. That's fine, right? We can think that, but they don't think that. And that is also fine for the purposes of modeling. We haven't done anything that's going to violate any modeling premises so far here. And moreover, terrorists act strategically to achieve their goals. So think about this for a moment. If terrorists were completely irrational and just did crazy things without any sort of explanation to it, then how is it that after 12 years, it's been about 12 years since September 11th happened, how is it that Al-Qaeda is still functioning as an organization? Yeah, it's severely diminished in its capacity because the United States has been fighting a war against Al-Qaeda and terrorism in general for about 12 years now, but it's still the case that these guys are, are still surviving, right? And if these guys were truly crazy and truly ridiculous and not acting strategically, that would not be the case after the United States has funneled billions of dollars to tr try to stop these guys. These guys are acting strategically. So if that's the case, then we can treat terrorists as smart and strategic individuals. And what we'll be seeing in this unit is that by doing this, we can actually yield useful policy prescriptions and actually learn something about terrorism. And I have absolutely no idea what you tell someone if you pretend that terrorists are crazy and, and then what, right? How do you come up with policy prescriptions if you make this assumption beforehand that terrorists are just weird and crazy people? Yes, they're strange in their preferences. They have not sensible preferences. They like killing people, but that doesn't mean that you can't model their behavior. And so going forward, what we're going to be doing in this unit, what we're not going to be doing, I guess I should start out with, is we're not going to be explaining why terrorists have these bizarre preferences to kill people. Again, this is International Relations 101. I think that's a very important question, right? How do psychopaths become psychopaths? But that's not the scope of international relations. This is the scope of psychology. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, more power to you. I'm not saying you shouldn't do this. I think this is a worthwhile research uh, field, but that's just not what we do in international relations. It's something that goes on in psychology classes. So go ahead and take a psychology class and learn about it. Uh, this type of psychopath uh, psychopathy, psych psychopathy, I'll get it right, uh, in a psychology class. So instead of what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking these preferences, these bizarre preferences for, for death and destruction as a given and then see where it takes us. And that's what we're going to be doing in this unit. So I hope you enjoyed this intro to terrorism and I hope to see you next time. Take care.